Let's go. All right, let's get started. Well, thank you everyone for coming. See, there's more people showing up, but we'll just get started and hope they figure out what's going on in the middle. How do I make this go? That. Woo, thank you. All right. So hi everyone. I'm Aditya Vajam. I'm a first year medical student here at Carl. Uh, I'm also the CIS section chair for the IEEE Engineering and Medicine and Biology Society, and I was formerly the assistant director of clinical systems at the Division of Digital Psychiatry at the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. It's a lot of words together. Uh, today, I'll be talking about asynchronous telemedicine and digital phenotyping, lots of words, from research to clinical implementation. For, before we get started, no disclosures. All right, so all of the research I'll be sharing with you today stems from work that I was doing with Dr. John Torres, the director of our division. Uh, I recently saw that he had done an interview with Transforming Care, and I just thought this was really funny because that first question hit kind of hard. We've never heard of the, a division of digital psychiatry. What is it? But they just, they just kept going with the heavy hitters. Um, and so my goal today is to answer these questions and the many more that may come up along the way. So to begin with, I want to talk a little bit about the trajectory of digital mental health and why digital phenotyping is today becoming more important than ever, especially since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, we've been seeing an increased need for psychiatric services. A diagnosis of COVID-19 was observed to be associated with a 200% increased likelihood of a first psychiatric diagnosis within 90 days. What's also interesting is that the psychiatric diagnosis the prior year was also associated with a 165% increased likelihood of a COVID-19 diagnosis. Now more than ever, the goal of digital medicine and mental health is to increase scalability and access to quality care. In the chart on the right are four steps that plot the trajectory towards brand new technology for prevention, health, and crisis management. Two years ago, we all saw the meteoric transition from primarily in-person healthcare delivery to synchronous telehealth through virtual visits, for example. The next transition is poised to move from the synchronous approach to a primarily asynchronous approach, utilizing smartphone and wearable apps for the management of physical and mental health. However, as you move up the ladder, increased efforts are required surrounding the safety, evidence, engagement, outcomes, and most importantly, the implementation of these strategies. Looking at the data around barriers to care, at least pre-pandemic, what's interesting is that we can see that patients don't actually dislike the idea of telehealth video visits. It's the physicians and the healthcare systems that need to catch up, that needed to catch up during the pandemic. This time, let's trailblaze. So where do we start innovating? There's a number of places we can look, from social media to clinical data systems and silos. Today, we'll be mostly focusing on wearables, apps, and clinical decision support. So today, we're in that transition stage, moving beyond virtual visits and telepsychiatry, rethinking mental health around three key points. First, it's clear we need new tools to capture individuals' real-time lived experiences. Next, we need to address clinical needs, and we need to address clinical needs by developing new algorithms for early warning signs, among other key methods. Finally, we need to integrate these tools and methods into practice by designing new clinics and services. And of course, these three goals are all integrated, but should also be built on top of a solid foundation of ethics and privacy, which is crucial. So let's talk about the bedrock of all of this work. Ethics and privacy are increasingly important in today's digital world. I like to think of digital health apps as like the Wild West right now. A little good, some bad, and mostly ugly. An analysis of the smartphone app stores published in 2021 found some worrying statistics. Of the 21,000 mHealth apps available on Android, tagged as medical or health and fitness, about 4% transmitted sensitive user data. Almost 30% had no privacy policy. And of those that did have a privacy policy, less than 50% of network traffic actually complied with it. So why is this so important? We've become accustomed to apps and websites collecting our user data and selling bits of that personal user data, usually for targeted ads and whatnot. But user data is one thing, and patient data is a whole other and far more concerning thing. 
Physicians are careful stewards of patient data. And as medicine moves towards digital health, we may need to start asking, what smartphone apps do you use to manage your health as part of a thorough history? Here's a not so fun fact. Only 10% of crisis management apps actually today actually reference crisis management in their privacy policies. Some of these apps from the study took way more taps to connect a user to a hotline than dialing 911 or 988, the new suicide prevention hotline number. One of them was actually an Australian app available to American users. So it would actually initiate a long distance call to an Australian crisis hotline. Patients using these apps unknowingly and without guidance may actually be hurting themselves. One app among the many, only one, included a citation to published literature about its efficacy, keeping that in mind. And one very popular app you may have heard of or even found out or used or and actually used daily, uh, found out that it was actually useless all along. It turns out the, digital, the placebo of a digital health app is, is not just not using an app. It needs to be a proper digital placebo. Headspace found out that doing basic breathing exercises were just as effective as using its apps. Even if the app weren't harmful and had solid evidence and proper privacy handling for patient data, it still needs to be an engaging app. It turns out that most apps aren't engaging for most patients and 10% or less keep using the app a month after downloading it. A few examples of this. People began using COVID Coach during the pandemic, but only 1.5% actually used it for more than two weeks. And Talkspace said almost 60 million people were using its virtual therapy service, when in reality, it was only 60,000. Another not so fun fact, it used to be that sometime in 2018, when we first started looking into this, one of the top 10 app store results when you searched for schizophrenia was actually an app that simulated hallucinations. Imagine for a second, a patient with schizophrenia desperately seeking help, and that's the app they run into. So in summary, the digital health app landscape kind of sucks right now. We all need to consider if and how our patients are using these apps and integrate them into the care plan. Because the genie is already out of the bottle and patients already can and do use these apps. But surely someone's regulating this nightmare, you might imagine. No, actually just no. Nobody's regulating this nightmare. The FDA only cares about the bare minimum and safety. But the FTC caught wind of this somewhat recently and decided it was time to do something about it. Basically, they reminded health app developers they're not actually exempt from the consequences of, of patient data breach, even if they think they're exempt from HIPAA. But the good news is that the FDA does care. Sometime in 2018, the FDA began work on the software as a medical device framework. I won't go into that much more detail on that, the pre-cert pilot program or all of the other regulatory approaches out there today. What matters today to us is how we can better understand and help our patients understand what apps to use with their care. So my team worked with the American Psychiatric Association to solve this problem. We came up with this pyramid that you can read more about on the APA website around how to evaluate mental health apps. There are many ways to understand the levels of this pyramid, but I like to see it more in the core principles of medical ethics, justice, non-maleficence, beneficence, autonomy, and finally, shared decision-making. As we move through the talk today, I'd like you all to keep these principles in the back of your mind. So right now you're thinking, wait, I have to learn this model and then go download and evaluate all these apps myself? You don't have time for that. You may not even be trained to do that. You don't know how to ask those right questions, what are the right questions, and so on. You might have to deal with apps outside of your knowledge space. So my team did the hard work for you. Over 600 mental health apps are already empirically rated for you at mindapps.org. It's not just selecting an app, though. It's important to align it with the patient's needs and care plan. What if the patient barely knows how to use their smartphone? How would they even use the app then? We put together a program for that, a series of workshops around digital literacy training, not just for patients, but also for clinicians. So now we can finally get to the, the first topic here. What is digital phenotyping? I imagine a lot of you might've been confused when you read the, the name of this ludicrously long title of this, uh, this talk. So digital phenotyping is something like a digital fingerprint of an individual, a snapshot in time. It may be unique to the individual, 
But perhaps we can see patterns emerge that can also be understood across broader population groups. Perhaps some groups respond better to some treatment strategies than others, for example. The patterns may change temporally or over time, giving us key insight into an individual's or a population group's mental health. The plus next to the digital phenotyping up there is also my team's way of saying, we need to give back useful insight, not just collect all the data. As we move towards a more dynamic view of mental illness, we can distill a statement like the one up here, what can I do next? I feel helpless, into underlying symptom domains. Perhaps the individual's mood and anxiety contributes the most to their condition, for example. But we want to move from segregating individual domains to understanding how these domains influence and interact with one another. This unlocks insight into the individual's condition that may not have been visible before. For example, if psychosis were a strong influencer of poor mood, and that strongly affects poor sleeping habits, it may make sense to develop a personalized treatment plan around that. To construct better symptom networks, you need more data and a variety of data, meaning digital phenotyping is very data driven. To construct better models or to better understand the lived experiences we seek to capture with digital phenotyping, we need to consider a multimodal approach. Using a smartphone as a basis, we wanna capture a variety of data, starting with cognition, memory, and attention, say through cognitive tests or brain games as they might be called. We also want to capture symptoms of depression, anxiety, and so on through surveys. Then we tap into what's uniquely possible with smartphones and wearables and capture indicators of fitness, like step count, as well as sleep patterns, sociability through call and text logs, and mobility through GPS, as well as Bluetooth or Wi-Fi signals. Finally, one of the most interesting new developments in this space is screen time. It's a new feature on Apple and Google phones that we can use to start capturing what apps are used and what apps are being used when, for example, Facebook and how long they were used, maybe too long, and other data, like how many times did the individual pick up their phone from a notification or keyboard typing and autocorrect metrics and more. Put all of these things together in one neat package. My team designed and developed the LAMP platform, which you can see a little bit of right now in the center screenshot. LAMP stands for Learn, Assess, Manage, and Prevent, which are also its main goals. We work closely with patients and clinicians through feedback panels when architecting LAMP. Ethics and privacy really come into play here as we uncover three core principles in the feedback we received, trust, control, and community. We received important feedback ranging from remote consent and ownership of data to how the app should be designed to strengthen the therapeutic alliance. LAMP really aims to answer a lot of clinical needs and power research methods, and it's made up of a few building blocks. I'll share more details about the LAMP platform soon, but first, with a tool like LAMP that can collect a truly large variety of data about an individual and provide a means of working with that data quickly and easily, what kinds of clinical questions can we tackle and how? The simplest kind of data to work with would probably be smartphone surveys, but you might be wondering, why take surveys on a smartphone? The chart on the right provides some insight into that, into how individuals respond differently on smartphone surveys when compared to paper and pencil in-person surveys. The black dotted line indicates a perfect one-to-one -one score. That is, individuals responded exactly the same way as they did it in person and at home on their phones. The red line is the healthy control group. And you can see that this group actually underreported scores on their phone versus in person. Even the teal line, individuals with schizophrenia, underreported scores by small margin. Another reason is to collect survey data about symptoms multiple times per day instead of just once per clinical visit, which might be months apart. And finally, there's a level of metadata you can capture here that you can't from a paper and pencil survey, like response latency to individual questions. For example, on the PHQ-9, a depression survey, an individual might mark, no, I'm not suicidal. But if they spend, say, 40 seconds thinking about that versus five seconds on other questions, that's something to start a conversation around. In the plot on the top right, we're able to validate that the group with schizophrenia in yellow scores significantly higher than in, on the PHQ-9 than the group of healthy controls, which we would expect. In the plot on the bottom right, we now have a whole new dimension to peek into. 
the group with schizophrenia takes longer to answer every question on the PHQ-9 than the healthy controls. Could that be a clinical marker? We can also begin to assess cognition in new ways on smartphones by translating conventional paper and pencil cognitive tests into new digital smartphone versions. Here we see the Jules game, which is actually a trails making test variant, where instead of drawing lines between circles, you tap on Jules on the screen in the right order. The unique micro variances in the way that an individual taps on the Jules, the correctness of their tap order and more can be bundled into a tap profile. You can use that tab profile to generate values that measure cognition over time for each individual. Now let's take a peek at what we can deduce from sensors like GPS. Let's map the individual's real-time location onto a green space map on the left and then compare survey scores against that. In the plot on the right, you can see that there's some weak link between living in a green area and reported symptoms of anxiety, depression, and psychosis. For a more granular real-time view, we can instead use accelerometer data. Using a time series analysis method called dynamic time warping, we align and measure the difference, the quantified difference in the individual's motion between days. Perhaps this individual went swimming or golfing in the month of July. We can even use metrics collected by the individual's phone that we wouldn't normally think of as being sensor data. For example, how long was the screen turned on? When was it turned on? Was it a notification? Is increased notification checking on your smartphone associated with paranoid thoughts or neuroticism, a factor of the big five ocean personality trait model? Now let's fuse accelerometer, screen time, and GPS together to estimate activity and sleep periods. On the left chart, you can actually see a pattern start to emerge that carves out sleep with little blips of sedentary behavior throughout the day. On the right chart, you'll notice a gap in the data, which actually highlights one of the bigger challenges for digital phenotyping, missing this in data collection. Whether it's variable sam sensor sampling rates or poor engagement with the app for surveys and cognitive tests, missing data impedes most of these methods. Combining different data types and viewing them over time, we can start to see different behaviors and patterns emerge in this figure. On the left is a psychosis survey, and in the middle is the amount of time spent at home derived from GPS data. Each box is an individual and yellow boxes indicate low variability over time, green indicates moderate, and blue or purple indicates high variability. On the right is a population heat map comparing these different features between healthy controls and patients with schizophrenia. Interestingly, in patients with schizophrenia, there is less correlation between home time and circadian rhythm, for example, and reported anxiety, depression, psychosis, and sleep survey scores. Now let's zoom into one individual's box. And here we see mobility in blue, sociability in red, and self-reported clinical outcomes in yellow. Most of these bubbles congregate at the bottom of the chart here, forming a baseline for the individual's usually expected scores. Though this baseline could gradually increase or decrease over time, here it's a fairly static boundary. The pink line with the red arrow above it is actually a hospitalization event for this individual. Preceding this event, you start to notice a few blips of mostly self-reported clinical outcomes, but also mobility and sociability scores above that baseline. We can use these scores with this baseline to predict relapse and hospitalization. And this is what that looks like across the population spectrum under the lens of different individual self-reported survey scores. In addition to predicting relapse, we may also want to see how the active data and passive data stack up to clinical skills administered in person. On the left is a comparison between the same in-person clinical scale and the smartphone survey version of it. There are two cases, basis and PSS, where the normalized scores don't match. On the right, we look at both the device motion sensor and a sleep survey against PSQI, a clinical sleep questionnaire. Only the sleep survey average score is strongly negatively correlated to the PSQI sleep duration. The sleep survey score variance, however, is strongly positively correlated to the total PSQI score. Interestingly, 
the variability in device motion data is strongly positively correlated to the PSQI sleep quality score. This does indicate that there's more work to be done to find out what digital phenotyping data or secondary features can be used as clinical targets effectively. Digital phenotyping, as we've seen thus far, is fairly static in nature, meaning there are some data collected at time t and inferences being made about some time t plus one. What if we could use it in a more adaptive way? Could the app prompt the patient to interact with it instead of the other way around? And then tune itself around the patient's evolving needs? Adaptive interventions allow us to do exactly that. Using inferences made from real-time data, we can intervene and adjust and attempt to adjust the patient's behavior and outcomes. And then we can measure whether we were actually successful in doing that or not. Now let's like, take a look at one early example of this in action. When we think about patient care, there's something ubiquitous to medicine that I haven't mentioned until now, prescribing medication to patients. One of the challenges in treating patients with psychiatric illness is ensuring medication adherence. Now there's a number of factors that go into why a patient may voluntarily or involuntarily become non-adherent to their medication. And we can try and map that out in various ways through various models, but medicine today almost assumes that adherence is the normal, but is it? I wonder if it really feels a lot closer to this meme I found on the internet. Understanding the root cause of medication non-adherence in individual patients can and should be really important in managing their treatment plan. But how do we do that empirically without relying solely on patient self-reporting? And that begins the story of Abilify My Sight, which is just a normal aripropozole tablet but with the digital sensor inside of the pill. The patient swallows the pill and it sends a signal when it's dissolved to a skin patch worn by the patient. That skin patch then sends a signal to the connected smartphone. The smartphone then sends a signal to the physician. For the first time, we could accurately track medication ingestion down to the millisecond it was ingested. Fun fact, the patch in the middle of the screen was actually uh, gifted to me, shall we say, during a visit with a patient. He just, he took his shirt off, ripped it off, and then handed it to me. I didn't know what to say, so I just took it back to the office with me before throwing it out. Unfortunately, the study didn't go that well. As it turns out, it could have been a strange and unsettling idea, especially to patients with schizophrenia, but the reality was more in the challenge of educating patients around the eight steps they had to follow in changing their skin patch two or three times per day. And then the pandemic happened, and this study became the least of our patients' concerns. Ultimately, the company supplying the digital pill part of this went under. I'm sharing this not to disparage Otsuka and Proteus's efforts here. I really think the idea could have worked. We found some incredibly interesting relationships between medication non-adherence and some of the other factors that I've already shared with you. This story should remind us of the importance of patient-centric and patient-focused design and involving those with lived experiences in our research. So it's evident now that there's great potential in digital phenotyping to address clinical needs, but how best would a tool like LAMP be integrated into a novel care model? As we move towards clinical utility, we've covered the kinds of digital phenotyping data we can collect, the theory of how different methods can be applied to that data to address clinical needs, and now it's important we look at the application of this work in a clinical setting. My team developed the digital clinic model to augment and extend traditional visit-based care to maintain a strong therapeutic alliance, whether in-person or virtual. In green is clinically actionable data, yellow is the tool and apps such as LAMP, and in orange is both methods and clinical targets, as well as what our team calls the digital navigator. There are already many limitations and constraints on what clinicians can pack into a face-to-face -face clinical visit, which could only be 20 minutes long. I would know, having recently taken the OSCE, a clinical skills exam, I didn't realize how short 15 minutes could actually be. The digital navigator is a specialized staff role, acting as a liaison between the technology and both the clinician and patient. Simplifying the clinical workload, digital navigators will assist with understanding and operating the app as well as summarizing some of the data. The ultimate goal in gray is to use all of this information towards the formulation of a personalized care plan. So what does that actually look like? What do the clinician and patient see on the dashboard when they take a look together during a visit? 
the large amount of data we collected, again, terabytes of data per individual, are processed and crunched into these rich visualizations that provide easy visual cues into how an individual is doing. We can adapt mobility, sociability, psychosis, step count, symptom networks, and more into a single at a glance view for the clinician to interpret. This is what forms the bedrock of creating a personalized care plan together with the patient. Here's one case example of an individual that dropped out of cognitive behavioral therapy. On the left are all the raw data, all in text logs that underlie the sociability feature and target. On the right are anxiety and depression smartphone survey scores. You can visually see how right before the individual dropped out, they had a peak anxiety score of 16. And a few weeks prior, they had a peak depression score of nine. So putting the data and methods together visually lets clinicians interpret and open conversations around that data during a visit. While it's important for the patient to work with the clinician closely in interpreting this data, we also received feedback that patients want to be able to use that data and visualizations for themselves. This was so important to them that we dedicated an entire tab of the LAMP app, of the home screen of the LAMP app for it. We're also working on building new and interesting ways to visualize all the data I've been talking about and help patients easily understand their own lived experiences better. But what do you do if your patient has a wild but valid and clinically interesting question? A patient that I worked with did. He hypothesized that air quality in his neighborhood was related to how many auditory hallucinations he heard. When we looked into this together many years ago, nothing in PubMed seemed to quite connect. So we decided to grab an off the shelf Internet of Things prototyping device and get to work. I wish I had brought it with me today. It's so small, it's like this big. It had a built in LTE antenna, a single clickable button, and most importantly, air quality, humidity, and temperature sensors. It took a total of five minutes to wire it into the LAMP platform, and it had a six month battery life. So he just had to take it with him wherever he went. He would press the button to indicate an auditory hallucination had just occurred. And after three months and a quick t-test, his hypothesis turned out to be false. But it was incredibly rewarding for him to learn and engage with his own health in this unique way that actually prompted us to co-author a co that he actually prompted us to co-author a case report with him as a patient. In summary, the digital clinic model forms this continuous feedback loop centered around shared decision-making, clinical engagement, evidence-based care, and a strong therapeutic alliance. All with digital navigator support every step of the way. Personalized active and passive data are collected and transformed into rich visualizations on the dashboard, which guides personalized learning resources and interventions, and each clinical visit slightly tweaks the personalized care plan. So how do we enable something of this scale? Let's revisit the LAMP platform. Briefly, what we call MindLAMP consists of the mobile and wearable apps for patients available on iOS and Android, as well as the clinician-facing dashboard that's available across modern desktops and web browsers. It's designed to be easy to use for clinics, research studies, and anything in between, as it's flexible and customizable. The data center is made of a lot of smaller moving parts that are optimized to facilitate a high throughput, again, terabytes per patient, of patient-generated health data in a HIPAA-compliant and secure manner. Finally, Cortex is a companion data analysis pipeline and data science programming interfaces, which brings support for adaptive interventions, interactive visualizations, and all of that. When architecting the LAMP platform, we wanted to avoid reinventing the wheel, so we started with a standards-based approach. We chose established and already ubiquitous web standards and protocols as the foundation of the platform instead of rolling yet another bri proprietary binary standard that would require custom tooling and significant programming effort. Each activity with which patients are able to interact is defined and encapsulated in an activity specification that contains the program code written in web compatible standards, HTML, along with descriptors of the required input configuration and output data. This novel data schema enables unification and harmonization of different data types with both backwards compatibility to data from legacy systems and future compatibility to data for systems that are not even available yet. This also allows organizations to securely control and curate their repository of available activities independent of other organizations using LAMP. 
It's really simple with a little bit of web design know-how to tap into the potential of LAMP and create your own custom instruments. The clinician configures an activity based on that specification, like a mood survey or exercise survey based off of the base survey spec. And they can set up notifications to alert the patient, say, once a day to take these surveys. Once the patient generated health data is in, we use open standards like JSONATA for structured query and transformation, the Vega visualization grammar to display dynamic interactive charts to both the clinician and patient, and so on. What's really unique and important about LAMP is the unified structured data format that we designed specifically for digital phenotyping of patient-generated health data, that we package as streams of catalog time series events. Once a clinic and its patient's profiles are configured, that configuration can be exported and then re-imported by other LAMP-compatible systems or interfaces. This enables reproducibility in both clinics and research studies. For example, by attaching the configuration file to a research manuscript or a clinical protocol. While it only consists of 12 core data types, it was designed and implemented with extensibility and interoperability with third-party accessories and healthcare systems in mind. Beyond just iPhones, Androids, Apple Watches, and Fitbits, it's possible to integrate any data source with a LAMP platform, even completely custom prototypes like I told you about before. You can easily query the structured data in the same way, whether it's cognitive tests or surveys or GPS and accelerometer. When a patient begins an interactive session with any activity, session-wide metadata regarding who, what, and when are recorded. When they complete this interactive session, all of the temporal slices, as we call them, are packaged into chronologically ordered events that are indexed under the patient's identifier as a stream of continuously generated data. For example, you can better understand how users use or how patients use and engage with the activities available to them as part of a study by extracting for each patient a real-time metric of what, I guess, what the patient used or how long they spent in meditation and what meditation sounds they preferred. You can query this data at any temporal resolution from one millisecond to a day to a year and so on and filter by the type of activity, mood survey, anxiety survey, trails making test, and so on. The LAMP platform implements an optimized push-based model. For example, instead of periodically requesting a patient's wearable device to upload new data from its sensors, the server configures that device with parameters assigned by the clinician, and the wearable device then automatically uploads sensor data as soon as it's generated and collected. While you can cold call the platform, and query a bucket of structured data, you can instead let the platform know about a predicate that you're interested in, creating a subscription. Now, when new structured data matching your predicate enters the platform is uploaded, the platform will call you instead, or you can just skip that step, skip that whole process entirely, and just have the platform run your Python, Python code automatically. Everything from subject enrollment, survey configuration, gift card delivery, and just-in-time adaptive interventions can be entirely automated, as shown here in the screenshot. For instance, if an individual's anxiety score is high, LAMP can pop up a notification saying, hey, here's a breathing exercise that might be helpful for you right now, or provide tips on managing anxiety in other ways. If a clinician chooses to enable it, LAMP also supports real-time messaging between clinicians and patients. The LAMP platform supports many patient-facing activities and passively collecting sensors across smartphones and wearable devices. These include advanced Apple Health Kit and Google Fit sensors, such as activity recognition and heart rate variability. Its data analysis toolkit synthesizes these into these raw patient-generated health data into clinically useful features and targets for machine learning analysis methods. For example, we can segment periods of time spent at home versus out and about, and time spent active versus sedentary, and so on. It even supports the previously mentioned cognition tap profiles, sleep estimations, and more. It automates your data analysis pipeline by transparently interposing the correct feature layers and creating a dependency graph of your data. Any raw sensor data is transparently cached during execution, and since multiple operations require the same raw sensor data, their execution is blocked until cache data becomes available. This avoids duplicated downloads, wasted computation, and oversaturation of the network. You don't really want to see our cloud bills because, again, we're talking terabytes and terabytes of data right now. 
by vectorizing array operations and parallelizing function calls, we target high performance and cost effectiveness while maintaining data security and policy compliance. This same pipeline operates on both active as well as passive data, unifying the conceptual model for processing clinical features derived from patient-generated health data. It removes the need to write custom code for every single sensor or activity across many patient devices. For example, the iPhone accelerometer measures Gs with a downward frame of reference, you know, Gs like the unit in physics, it's been a while. Um, but on Android, it's meters per second squared without a frame of reference. Sure, you could just do the math, divide by 9.8 and, you know, do the math to figure out like altitude and all this and so on. But these are all technical details that shouldn't have to matter to clinicians and researchers. So the LAMP platform transparently harmonizes all the data for you. With 20 lines of Python code, I can embed this interactive visualization that updates in real time on the dashboard whenever a patient or clinician logs in. So in summary, we now know that the pandemic has exposed systematic gaps in care and presented the urgent need and opportunity to address them. The LAMP platform sets a precedent for what asynchronous digital healthcare is today and what it could be tomorrow. While I focused on digital mental health, many of our collaborators are doing wonderful things with digital phenotyping across medical specialties like cardiology, anesthesiology, neurology, neurosurgery, and many more. There are many teams, oh, there we go. Um, there are many teams around the world using the LAMP platform today. It's open source and completely free to use at any organization, including here at Carl. And that was asynchronous telemedicine and digital phenotyping from research to clinical implementation. Thank you for listening. If you'd like to get in touch, let's chat after the Q&A, send me an email or find me on Twitter. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Are there any questions? Raise your hand and we can get going with those. Ah, yes. All the way in the back. Anyone else? One more over there. I can't see as I'm trying to watch this here. So I'm uh, first of all, that was that was amazing. My this is like every engineer's dream. Um I I had two questions though. First, I'm I worry that the data would be would suffer from survivorship bias because like so many psychological conditions, like you know, severe schizophrenia, um, depression, even like severe ADHD, like one of the symptoms is the inability to engage with like day-to-day -day things. So I I worry that, you know people would fall off. And so I'm wondering if you guys are correcting for that. I know you've considered it, but like, how have you corrected for it? And then I do have one more question after you're done. Sure, yeah, fantastic question. In fact, the slide that I showed you where there was data missingness, which as I try and pull this, it's probably not gonna work. Oh, there we go. Um, we actually figured this one out somewhat early on um, and we were just as concerned, but then we figured out, wait a minute, we can just take that missingness, that data that's missing because patients were too depressed to pick up their phone or had too much psychosis or some other symptom domain to interact with us, we can just turn that into a new feature. And it works fantastically because it is in fact such a strong correlate with things like depression or, or schizophrenia like you've mentioned. That's one factor. And then the other thing is of course, we want to gather data from people across the spectrum, individuals with lived experiences, not just in mental health issues, but maybe cardiology stuff. Like what does a heart disease patient look like? What different types are there? Maybe instead of just looking at heart failure as one category, are there different etiological factors that you can split out? We don't have the ability and the bandwidth right now to pull that off, but that's why we're collecting data about healthy controls. And we, I think our biggest study right now is um, a cross nation study with about 500 college students. So we looked at actually college students across you know huge campuses, even at UIUC, by the way. Uh, we looked at you know what kinds of different metrics you wanna collect. And how do we pull out? Like, are people struggling in class and that leads to their depression? Or is it the other way around? So collecting more data, putting that together is really how we solve this. Another big study is kind of a multinational, like a huge NIH project. We're collecting data from India. We're collecting data from Europe. We're collecting data from Australia. 
because maybe what we see as physical or mental illness here in the United States is not the same over there. Next question. Thank you. Or follow up. Um, yeah. And my second question. So, so many apps like, you know, Facebook, Instagram, all of that stuff, they kind of depend on you opening and clicking and like, that's how they make their money. And so when you mentioned like, oh, maybe we could have the app prompt the person, I was like, oh, oh no, because, you know, if, if the app and, and, you know, the stakeholders have a vested interest in that patient opening that app and engaging with it, I worry that that would almost like contribute to, you know, the pressure the patient might feel. And I, I just think that in general, it's just kind of unethical to force an already mentally ill patient to engage with, with something. So I'm wondering like, where does your funding come from and how would you protect patients from, um, frankly, corporations who do not give a crap about them and just want them to open the app? Fantastic follow-up question there. Um, our team agrees with you. We think, yeah, that can be unethical to depending on how it's implemented, who's implementing it, for what purposes. Um, a lot of our funding does come from international organizations like, well, NIH is not international, but Welcome Trust International. Um, honestly, I don't, I don't know the whole list. You'll, you'll have to ask Dr. Torres about that and I can surely get an answer to you later. Um, but yeah, we're, we're, we're trying to keep it more as a research science and implementation phase. We're not really partnering with, with companies to do anything about this. And we also agree that for, for a lot of us in the audience and myself, I don't want an app to prompt me every time. But we actually did find that some patients with depression or schizophrenia or the other bipolar disorder and the other illnesses that we actually work with, those populations actually wanted that. They told us, wait, how do you expect me to fill out all these surveys every day when it doesn't tell me to do that? So it's a difference of preference sometimes. And of course, at the end of it all, we always have informed consent. We have very strict protocols around who sees what data how it's managed and everything like that. We're under very strict scrutiny from Harvard. So just, they're very tight about that. Thank you. A great job, that was a fantastic talk. Um, my question is, so in schizophrenia in particular, one of the main symptoms is believing they're being watched, monitor that's being sold, aliens, implanted chips. You know, it's a very, very real thing for these patients. And I can imagine having an app saying, hey, we've noticed this about you, could be really triggering for a lot of these patients. I'm just curious, like, how that is being explained by a physician, how that's being accounted for you know, so you can really be treating the full spectrum of people with this condition versus just those who, you know, have enough control to understand what's going on. Another fantastic question. You're absolutely right. Patients, especially with schizophrenia, like you mentioned, may not want to be told by an app, oh, by the way, we noticed X, Y, and Z about you. And that's why in some of the research studies in which we especially have populations with those concerns, we don't do that. That's where the digital clinic model comes into play, where we have basically a psychiatrist, John, and a social worker and a digital navigator and another clinician. So the team of four people basically work with the patient. And it's not like the app is notifying you saying, hey, you seem really depressed right now. Like that's not what's happening. And it's more that when the patient comes in, this data is examined by all these different people and that opens a conversation and then the psychiatrist takes it from there. So how that works, I don't know. I'm not a psychiatrist. I'd need to ask John. I have a question, Aditya. Good to see you. And great job. Day pod six. Okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, two, two com comments and a question. So first of all, my question is regarding, I, I have to throw in climate change and environmental planetary health, is, is, which is my passion. You mentioned such an interesting study where they looked at air quality and the hallucinations. And I just didn't realize the capacity of a cell phone to pick up on air quality. And have you seen, in, in, as opposed to any data collection regarding air quality and overall health and populations, have, have you seen any applications more broadly for public health? Another fantastic question. I wish I had more answers for you. A lot of the work that I've shown in this is actually work our team has done. So I could call up my colleague who actually wrote that paper on green space versus schizophrenia. I could ask him. I don't have the answers at this time. And it is still a very nascent area. People are looking into this as kind of like, a, oh, what if? It's not 
it's not really in like a serious like oh my god we need to enact policy change around it just yet but hopefully it gets there and then my comment is from uh the older you know i barely can figure out how to do um group me or you know snapchat or what i anything i have to do for like students or slack or something so how do you combat um a lot of the people who you're impacting are older and don't have the technical savvy or the finances to have a phone of that sophistic level of sophistication and they're shared phones I, a lot of our patients when i was in practice my a lot of patients shared a phone which was a so how do you address some of the uh, financial social determinants that might impact who could use this another fantastic question one interesting thing about the phone, some of our patients that, again, they're all great people, and I, I've, I've built a, a relationship with them after so many years, but one of them told me point blank, they were like, yeah, you know, I'm signing up for the study, and thank you for that new iPhone that you just bought, but I'm just going to leave. And I'm like, wait, 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 you're just not going to do the study? And he was like, yeah, it's more lucrative for me to take the iPhone and sell it than it is to actually be a part of the study. A lot of our patients have what are called, I guess, colloquially by them, Obama phones burner phones that I suppose were, were given and more like paid for for populations with these different considerations. And so their phones may not actually run software like this. So that's where it's like, okay, well, does software need to cut off and say, well, you don't have, you have an iPhone 12, not a 13 or 14. What happens now? You can't run it. We don't know. We don't know how that's going to work from a technological point of view either. Um, we're working on that. So I'll get back to you soon. Thanks. Any other questions? Oh. Uh, this is really, really good. Um, my question is, it's kind of more of like a thought question um, and kind of more on ethics. So like all the data they present, all the data collection, like all the different things you can get, like seems so amazing and so important. But do you think there's like a, a line to be drawn of like research collection and like crossing the line of like, this is kind of surveilling people, like not just geolocation, but like kind of taking it to a different level. 100%. Um, my team has a joke that we like to say because we found out about, I mean, back in 2020 when TikTok was brand new, you know, everyone was starting to yell about, oh my God, it's collecting so much data. So the joke we had internally is, dang, we should just partner with TikTok. They get more data than we do. <laughs> but you know, the joke aside, which no, we're not doing that. Joke aside, yeah, there is a very... I wouldn't even call it a thin line. It's a very fat line. And to tread across that line and go from surveillance to, because again, we get real time GPS. We know exactly what people are doing exactly every millisecond of the day. How is that not some level of surveillance or some level of creepy? That's why it's so important to explain and convey like why we're doing these things, what we're doing them for, and make sure that, okay, this is something your physician, your psychiatrist wants to work on with you. It's not Facebook or some other big company trying to figure things out. And that's really the only solution we have right now. Um, there are some patients and some, some different parts of the studies that we work with. Some institutional sites, like in Australia, for example, their laws are way stricter in some cases. They just say, no, turn that off. You're, we're, not getting, we're not giving you our GPS location, period. And we're like, well, no, we're not going to use it for anything. We want to like map this out and compare it versus this and that. They're like, no, can't do that, period. So it's a big, it depends, unfortunately. And actually, another thing I wanted to answer to, to Dr. Rosencrantz, you were asking again, like, how do we teach people how to use smartphones and whatnot? Um, one of the things my team would do, actually, in the early, the nascent phases of all these studies is we would actually go out to the, uh, the community clubs, as they're called, like the, the places where patients with mental illness actually go to kind of rehabilitate and learn how to work with, that, with each other and, and apply for jobs and things like that. And so John would run Ask the Doc, and that was more medical questions. Why does this medication do this to me? And so on. And I was just kind of like there, like, hi, I'm tech help right here. I've had so many patients, they came up to me and they would say like, hey, I can you teach me like what app is there to remember I have to go see my doctor today? I'm like, oh, that's a calendar and Google Maps. Like they didn't know how to navigate the Boston rail system or the, I don't know if it's rail, subway system and so on. So we had to start there. And that really is a tangible difference in quality of life for these people and, and a lot of other people around the world with different things. So you just have to go to the community. You have to start with patient and clinician education. When the clinicians know about these concerns and these problems is when they can suggest it to patients as well. One more question in the back there. Phenomenal talk. Um, 
question regarding, since it is open free software mm -hmm. um, and open to anybody, are there any firewalls or concerns that um, it's available everywhere that those companies can pick it up and utilize it and put in their own firewalls to, um, to do the nefarious things that we're all concerned about in terms of tracking and, and engaging with customers, uh, well, customers with patients. And, it's a fantastic question. Again, I may have fudged it a little bit. It's free and open source to use by anyone, anywhere, except your IT department has to get in touch with ours, which is me. So I have now spoken to 70 or 80 different hospital people at, at different phases of IT, from like chief informatics officer down to, hey, you know, I manage the server, something's going on, and they call me. So yeah, yes, it's, it's free and open source, but you do need to have an institutional affiliation. You have to send us your IRB, your, clini your clinical protocol, and we talk with you. Usually that's also me. And that's what sets the tone for, okay, this makes sense. You, you are, you know, Carl Foundation Hospital. We know who you are. You're not just Joe Schmo who wants to run a digital phenotyping study. You know, there's, there's a difference in that that we can very easily detect, especially if we're asking for clinical protocols and IRBs. So rest assured, it's not like our patient repositories out there in the world and there's people trying to figure out what's going on. I personally have seen 50 different configurations of how these hospitals and organizations are taking care of things. And, uh, there. So every single one on, on this list I'm about to bring up, I, I know their firewall configuration and everything inside and out. And when I find out about, hey, wait, this is going to have some level of data breach, or there's this vulnerability a few years ago called Log4j, and the whole world panicked about it. I was the one sending emails to a lot of these places and saying, hey, by the way, can we just get on a call real quick and figure out this, this stuff and upgrade your infrastructure? This is also why we recommend partner with and pay for Amazon Web Services or Microsoft Cloud or Google Cloud, whatever it may be, because then they take care of it for you. And it's also way easier, but it is expensive. That's the only downside. Hopefully that answers your question. We have time for one more question. If there's no more questions, thank you all for coming. Really appreciate it. <laughs>